Hello, 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 hello. Hey, hi, hi, hi. Why, 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 why do I? Why, why do I? Why do I? Why? Ah, English. I'm speaking in English. Sometimes I'm speaking Spanish. Sometimes English. English para paringish. English para paringish. Oh, paring, oh, oh, paring. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, uh, okay. Agreement to explore what on the surface seems like a pretty clever compromise. Put in place an oil. Okay, we're talking about something about something about something about 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 love you, love you, love you. Price cap on Russian oil. One February, which means they haven't been able to sell or export gold, not least to the biggest buyers like the UK. Which means the sanction is really only consolidating the status quo, right? Yeah, Russia's having a really hard time selling its gold, which has cut off an important stream of revenue for the country. And the amount that Russia makes from selling its gold each year, about $20 billion, is about the same as what it makes every month from selling oil. But it's still not a small amount, obviously $20 billion. That's more than the U.S. makes exporting computers every year. <laughs> that is a lot of money. <laughs> yes, it is. Which is why Russia's actively looking for new markets for its gold. And China's an obvious one, right? The Shanghai Gold Exchange is one of the fastest growing gold markets in the world. So we're likely to see much more Russian gold showing up there. But some gold producers in Russia are reportedly looking to sell directly to buyers in Asia and the Middle East, which hasn't really happened in the past. And if that becomes a trend, it could actually change the global gold market forever. Forever? Forever. It's a big deal, Whoa. this. All right, Darian, that's a pretty big act to follow. Yes. You're going to be looking at another policy idea that came out of the G7, potentially as world changing. We will see. So my indicator is one that the G7 thinks is too high. $20 billion. And that's how much oil revenue Russia got in May, according to an estimate by the International Energy Agency. About the same as what they make in gold every year, yeah. Black gold is obviously uh, even more lucrative. Uh, but even though the US has banned imports of Russian oil and Europe has announced a plan to eliminate Russian oil imports by the end of the year, there are still a lot of countries that are kind of saying, all right, rich countries, we're not going to get too involved in this Ukraine matter. You know, we have mouths to feed and we're going to keep buying Russian oil. China and India are the two largest examples. We talked about this on The Indicator a couple of days ago. So when the G7 met last weekend, they seemed to recognize that lecturing other countries to stop buying Russian oil wasn't going to work. I'm glad they figured that one out. Yeah, exactly. So they came up with an agreement to explore what on the surface seems like a pretty clever compromise. Put in place an oil price cap on Russian oil. Band together as the world and say, Russia, we will only pay up to a maximum price for your oil. So this seems like a win-win, right? Like the countries that are still buying oil from Russia can get their oil, but in an era of sky-high oil prices, they can get it much cheaper. And that means Russia's oil money shrinks and it's less able to fund its war. Yeah, and let's not forget that's what all these sanctions are about. So there are a lot of details to be hashed out. What should the price cap be set at? When will it kick in? How would it work with threatening sanctions on shipping and insurance companies that are involved in the oil trade? Which countries would get that cheaper oil? But the biggest problem of all is monitoring and enforcement. So even now, oil tankers are obscuring their trade in Russian oil. They're turning off their transponders when they go near Russian ports. They're blending oil from other places and lying about where the oil comes from. This sounds pretty gloomy, Darian. I'd like to know what the optimistic take on how this price cap is going to work. The biggest case for this policy is that even if it has a limited effect... Russia could be forced to pump less oil. And once they do that, it is really hard to start ramping up capacity again, as we've seen in the US now with its oil industry. So even an imperfect policy could have an effect. So that's gold and that's black gold. And uh, Waylon, you've got another commodity for us. I do. I have golden waves. Wheat. Whoa. <laughs> Wheat. So my indicator is $9 a bushel. That's about where wheat is trading at the moment. And it signals a tiny bit of relief in this huge run-up we've seen in wheat prices. Yeah, this is a massive run-up that's driven up food prices all over the world and helped create what the UN's described as an unprecedented global hunger crisis. 
Now, to give you some context, at $9 a bushel, that's still above where wheat was trading before Russia invaded Ukraine. But it's down significantly from the peak it hit earlier in the war when wheat traded over $12 a bushel. Russia wants to kill Lithuania. Russia wants to kill Finland. Russia wants to kill Sweden. Russia wants nothing to do with you. Russia, 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 Russia. Now, create a Russia. I think God in God in bind to the God in bind to the God in bind. God in bind to the God in bind. YouTube, YouTube, subscribe. YouTube, YouTube, subscribe. Russia wants Lithuania to um, <clears throat> let everything through the border. Now, Lithuania. Fuck you. Russia, Lithuania, and the numbers of technology, asset technology, um, Joe Biden and other countries are going there to Ukraine to arm Ukraine to the max, to the tooth, to arm Ukraine to the max, to the tooth, and this is going on for future reference, they're going to have higher prices, they're going to pump it, they're going to give us headaches, they're going to fuck us up, they're going to say something like, oh, it was war that uh, put the food up, it was war that the milk went up, it was war that interest rate, did. this, that, and China, did that. It must be bad, some bad, we created bad, we did bad, we're not bad, I was bad, oh, oh, I'm crying now, you're crying, you're crying, you're crying, you're crying, you're crying, history of your crying place, I love you sexy. Hello everyone, I'm Karen Cho, anchor for CNBC. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important session. You owe it to the community to actually have that scenario covered, not a single technical control. Minister, can I get a quick response from you? Robert just mentioned that if it's a national security threat that a company is facing, there is a role for funding for the state. How do you feel about that? Would Singapore step in and provide funding for companies that are under increased threat because of national security? Well, I think in the first place, um, as a you know, state, um, we have to look at our own, um, you know, provision of services and ensure that we set standards at a high enough level. Um, actually, if you look at uh, some of the critical information infrastructure, uh, quite a, a lot of it is operated by the state. So say, for example, you know, even if our power grid is, um, is privatized to a very large extent, um, the cybersecurity measures that we impose on the power generation companies, um, is, uh, is one way of ensuring that the standards are met. But there are also other ways in which we can help. For example, understanding where the risks are. I think this is where government can play an active part. But I also want to add to what um, you know, Robert was saying, which is that um, I think it makes sense for us, you know, uh, when we think about scenarios, not to think that uh, we have not yet been breached. And in fact, in Singapore, um, the way we think about it is that the cyber attack uh, is not a question of uh, if, but when. And so uh, we have to move from preventive measures to being able to recover from an attack. And so cyber resilience, building it into enterprise risk management, um, is, is really important. And uh, it has to be at a very high level of uh, uh, leadership that uh, demands that these steps be taken. Minister, you've taken us neatly into the next area. I want to talk about perception gaps because the World Economic Forum has identified that there is a perception gap when it comes to just how prepared businesses are around cybersecurity versus cyber leaders. Now, 92% of business executives agree that cyber resilience is integrated into enterprise risk management strategies. Only 55% of cyber executives agree. So the experts in the house think that the uh, level of planning is just not adequate at this stage. Can I come to you on that point? Because, Jürgen, you've seen the level of uh, preparedness when it comes to locking down facilities, stopping criminals from entering the premises. What do you make of that perception gap and whether business leaders are ready for the task of averting cybersecurity attacks? I mean, from my experience and talking to a, a number of senior leaders in companies, uh, there is definitely the level of, of awareness has been rising. It's, it's much better. But that does not necessarily mean that there is a comprehensive understanding of the cybersecurity risk in a company, mm. including what you said, the, the supply chain, your partners you are, you are connected with. And again, this comprehensive understanding and translating that into implementing the necessary measures. 
doing it often enough because what we need actually is information exchange in real time um, because the situation is so dynamic. Crime patterns are changing, sometimes within hours slightly or within a, a, a couple of weeks at least. And, and being a part of, a, of an ecosystem nationally, regionally and internationally that allows these real-time information exchange. So for me, it's not a surprise that there is still a gap between the senior management, that they are, there is a general awareness. But again, investing in specific measures, including your, your, your teams, your staff, to reduce human failure in, in these procedures and to understand that this is something you cannot just do once a year, like a, like a medical check. Um, you have to do it as something permanent. There is still obviously a lot for us to do and to increase the dialogue, for instance, between law enforcement, because we, on the one hand, we are aware what's going on. On the other hand, we need the data, which are in the private sector. So we need your reports. Without your reports, we are blind. And, and, and that is something I mentioned, this, this huge number of unreported crime. That is a gap that we need to close together, not just law enforcement. That requires that we build bridges between our silos, the islands of information, and in a more strongly way institutionalize the cooperation that already exists. And for us, the World Economic Forum is an important player on the global uh, on the global level. Europe is going down the pathway of requiring some sort of reporting within 24 hours, which is to your point that often we see this just brushed under the carpet, that people don't want to disclose that there has been some sort of cyber breach because of reputational risk. For whatever reason, yeah. Right. Uh, Chad, let me come to you because you did touch on that perception gap a moment ago. And one of the conversations I had with the cybersecurity expert this week was that nothing's changed in 20 years, that people still perceive there is a risk. They're trying to protect absolutely everything in the organisation rather than the most critical information. Just touch on what the strategy should be for business from here given that there is such a wide gap in how the industry experts feel the preparation should be? So, I mean, I'm surprised that you think nothing has changed in 20 years. That's not me, that's an <laughs> right? industry expert. So, I can only say that, you know, when I was walking up here, I accidentally met the chairman of IBM, and uh, uh, he said, where are you going? This is Arvind Krishna, who's the chairman of IBM. And I said, I'm going for the cyber security uh, you know, at the forum, and he said, oh, that's a threat of the decade, and it will remain the threat for the next decade. So, so one part is very, very clear that most of us do realize that it is a threat. The second part is that most of us also realize that while we know 100 ways to secure our IT systems or the network or the end user or the supply chain, but the attacker has to succeed only once. Mm -hmm. So clearly for us, whether it is technology, it needs to be refreshed, whether it is the processes, they need to be, you know, you know, talking about those viruses. I mean, or the healthcare, as you put it, Jurgen. I mean, it is very, very clear that our processes have to be current. And number third is people also, it is not only that uh, they need to know how to protect, but they also need to know how to anticipate. So I think uh, the world over, we need to realize that the various studies have shown there is a skill shortage in cybersecurity. And I don't think that all of us are putting enough attention to creating that lateral skill force of 2.7 million people that are required by 2025. So I think it's a bigger challenge of people, process, and technology. So Catherine, maybe just you know, building on what Chandra has said, I suspect that the perception gap it comes about because one group is looking at all the known unknowns and saying that we've got this. And then there is another group that is thinking about all the unknown unknowns and saying, no, we haven't really got it. And that's why you, know, you have uh, this very big difference in perception. In cybersecurity, exactly as Chandra says, you don't know what you don't know. And you have to believe that you know, uh, these are very serious vulnerabilities and you have to be on the lookout and trying to exchange information with each other, try and get better to understanding the problem. 
I'm glad I you think touched many, it, yes. many companies still start seriously working on that when they first have been hit and, and the data are blocked. This is where the action starts. Oh, who are my, my points of contact? Where are my data? Who can help? That's my experience in talking to a lot of senior leaders who called, I have been attacked, what am I going to do? Too late, sorry. You can see how engaged the panel is, but I know there are some questions out here on the floor. So we have promised to open it up for the conversation with our uh, audience. So if you would like to pitch a question, please stand up and we will bring a microphone to you. Uh, we have a, a question here first. We have a microphone ready. If you could state where you're from too, please. Yes, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a professor emeritus from the University of Aarhus. Uh, the United Nations have started negotiations on a convention on cybercrime. Uh, uh, what do you expect? And the question goes in particular to Mr. Stock and Madame Theo. Should I start? So, yes. Um, thank you, Wolfgang, for that good question. I mean, it's a, it's a global problem, right? And it requires a global solution as many other threats that the, the world is facing. You cannot deal with that in, just on a national level. You want to talk about global or global or global. Why don't you get together and create a building or something that is technology advanced. Show us, show us, show us better, more. Not this now, better, more advanced. We are the future. We are stuck in this planet Earth to escape out of here. We've been playing as a slave to this Earth. Technology is one, two, or three, or four, or five different chips. Why do you create computers? Why your country is powerful? Why is power so interesting? Why do we need food? Why do we need petrol? Why do we need this? Why do we need that? Everything is technology. I am in crazy insane. This cannot go like this. Google, 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 YouTube, YouTube, Facebook, YouTube, Facebook, YouTube, Facebook, YouTube, Facebook, YouTube, Facebook, International Computer Network. Share, share, like. I love you, sexy. You're listening to the Cyberwire Network. You would have thought someday uh, if I was lost, but it feels a little weird at first. And then, you, at least for me, I found I really I look forward to it again. If I could, if I if I didn't blow it up with some critical meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we're in the same boat here, and on our efforts, so I totally can relate. So, Patrick, I want to transition maybe a little bit the conversation. You've gotten into into this during our discussion, but I think with all of your experiences, I'm sensing there's sort of a set of philosophies that you apply. And I thought maybe we could spend a few minutes on, as you step back now, as you've transitioned out of VMware or thinking about what you do next, it seems you have a set of beliefs that you bring to these roles. And I'd love to kind of maybe walk through those and, uh, and sort of understand how you think of being a CEO and how you think of being a leader. Yeah, for sure. And uh, a lot of these I built over years, some of them as CEO, some of them before I was a CEO. Again, I believe that great leaders, great operators always build a, a, a set, a framework or a set of beliefs on how they run their business. Some of Some people articulate those very clearly or need to have frameworks. I'm a framework guy. I really like that. I have, I have them for many, many parts of the way we ran the business. Yeah. I think that is so important. And I actually think saying what those are is really, really important because it ensures that for me and for the team around me, we're aligned on, well, this is how I think about things. And so and I have those for looking for your next, you know, your next role in a company. I have those for how you lead as a senior leader, et cetera, et cetera. For the company, I, I have, I, I said this to the team all the time, seven core beliefs or philosophies on how you build a great company. Seven. I, I want to hear the seven. I think people want to hear the seven, given the track record uh, and how you've applied them. I'd love to, I'd love to walk through those. Well, the, the, the first is pretty straightforward, and, and most uh, CEOs, founders, most people out there could probably get out of the seven, many of them right. But the first one is you need an aligned vision and mission on what you're trying to build, what you're trying to do. And it is surprising to me how many companies out there may have that but don't articulate it 
or may not even have it. But usually most companies, especially early stage companies, have it. And in many cases, you kind of lose it after a while because, oh, isn't this just obvious? But having an aligned vision and mission is really, really important. Uh, And for a couple of reasons, you know, the number one reason is if you run a great company, you've got a lot of people who are making decisions every single day about should they go left or should they go right? If they truly understand what the company's trying to accomplish, They won't always make the right decision, but they're going to make more right decisions than wrong decisions because they understand what we're trying to do. So you you have to have an aligned vision and mission. And then the second thing you do is you have to be able to, you have to say that. We started, we did monthly company meetings. And for years, the whole, for most of the time I was at Carbon Black, we started every single meeting laying out what our vision and mission was. It sounds so simple and, well, it's, do you really need to do that? And the answer is, yeah, because, you know what, most of us, uh, there's a lot of things going on every day. And, and in the end, through osmosis, they would get it. You know, my team would get it. We would all get it. Everyone knew it in the company. So, number one, aligned vision and mission. Well, and you're, adding, uh, you're adding so many employees. I see that here as well. I mean, you, you think you do a good job communicating something a year ago, and then a year later you have, you know, one or 200 more employees that haven't, weren't there at that time when maybe you developed and announced that mission. So it's, you have to keep repeating it, right? Yeah, that's right. And typically that vision and mission uh, are aligned with what's the value that you're going to offer to your customers out there in the marketplace. So ours was a world safe from cyber attacks. You're aligning around what you as a, as a company are trying to create and what you're trying to do for the customer that you're giving value to. That's number one. You got to do that. And you I'm going to sell a product, uh, the product is being sold, and technology cyber attack. Uh, we don't know how to get rid of um, um, things that are your computer, a uh, virus. So we cannot, we need to have technology advance and technology advance, UFO advance. Everything is advanced and allow you to be advanced and more advanced and get advanced. Like YouTube, share YouTube, share YouTube, like YouTube, my channel is called Intermix Hector, Intermix Hector. To people who do exercise and do a beautiful, the legs, the arms, and the body are beautiful. You are a very nice person. You look nice. You're very, very good. You need me to look after you. You need me to create money, this, that, and the other, help you out. Holidays, cyber attack, cyber attack, Israel, uh, um, Australia, uh, Chile, um, Ukraine. Akio wa ya pa technology advance technology advance international computer network I love you and better 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 good Today on the Vergecast Andy Hawkins joins us to talk no, no one else could get away with just saying I'm I'm making these cuts deal with it Does Tesla still not have like a PR department no. Could no. that be part of this? Just somebody who actually knows about comms being like, hey, buddy, your Twitter account does not actually equal corporate comms. And there's, oh, no, no, there's no, other no, ways to no, do no, this. No, 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 no. That ship has <laughs> sailed. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 no. It's like you're, you're talking. I love you. 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 Technology at pains. I love you. I love you. I love you. Technology at pains. Sport, karate. Uh, Kung Fu, I am sexy. We need exercise, exercise. Our mind, blow, read, um, write, uh, be creative, look at something, and then create a writing. Um, help you, me, them. Everybody need together hugs, kisses. I need you, you need me. Uh, I'm here, you there. Love me, reply, reply, please. I will suspect you are very good manners. Thank you. Out of like most CEOs don't want to do that, but Elon, like in particular, is like, don't get in front of my Twitter account. Like, you, yeah. the United States government, you want to get in front of my Twitter account? I'll just buy Twitter. Yeah, like, that's where he's at. With this. I mean, he's he's literally still involved in like litigation with the SEC over the issue of whether or not he needs to get his tweets checked out with regards to whether or not they're like they would have a material impact on Tesla's share price. And he's trying to get them to like vacate the settlement that he he made, which required him to have someone, some lawyer somewhere. You talk about Trump's music, man. Uh, Elon's <laughs> Twitter sitter is like another job. But he doesn't actually have one. Is another job that I feel could be categorized in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he hasn't actually employed the Twitter sitter anyway. No, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, it's weird that he hasn't just said, "I'm I'm making this move." 
um, cutting Tesla down to be ready for the recession. They did the same thing in 2017. They had layoffs in 2017 and they slow rolled it and it came out in drips and drabs over like multiple weeks and it was an excruciating news cycle. And they clearly just haven't learned anything since then, that this is just the way that this company does business. And, you know, in terms of like its labor practices, it's been well documented that there have been numerous lawsuits filed against Tesla over uh, um, a toxic work culture, racist incidents happening in its factory in Fremont, gender discrimination. It's just, you know, sort of the list goes on and on. And so it seems like <laughs> the way that they are doing these layoffs are just sort of part and parcel with sort of like a culture at Tesla that is extremely problematic. Well, and Neilai, I'm not sure I agree with you that Elon Musk is the is the CEO who can get away with this right now. Like it's 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 been a moment where like investors in particular are not super convinced that Tesla is a very well run organization. And with all the Twitter stuff going on, there's been a lot of, you know, nerves and so I think if he were to come out and say I'm laying off 10,000 people like two years ago, Elon Musk, everybody just goes, you're so brave. And that's great. Now I'm not sure that works for him the same way. And I think there are a lot of people out there who are like worried about the future of Tesla, who are looking for reasons to get really, 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 really worried about the future of Tesla. Well, and Tesla's stock is not doing great. All of his wealth is tied to it. I have no doubt that he's thinking, OK, which hurts my stock more? Just one ripping the Band-Aid or doing these like low trickles and hoping that everybody talking about the music man distracts from the fact that we keep laying people off every week. I don't know. I don't want to like be full CNBC, Eli, but like do it like I don't know that he cares that much. And also like Tesla is the most shorted stock in like world history. Like people have been betting against Tesla stock the whole time. Like at the end of the day, it's like bad overall. Right. Like people are losing their jobs. It's like heartbreaking. It's just strange to me that in everything else. It's brash moves. And in this thing that he signaled so loudly that he thinks the economy is bad and Tesla is overstaffed, he's letting it persist as opposed to just doing it. And I think maybe part of that is like he is distracted with all of the other things like buying Twitter, like fighting with the SEC, like SpaceX generally is a going concern. Do you know he has a company that drills tunnels under the surface of the earth to slowly drive one car through them. They just got a new project in Vegas. So they're, they're, they're still doing it. The official tunnels of Gen 5, sis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just like with all that stuff, like maybe, maybe he was like, just figure it out. And like, so there's a slow bleed. It's just interesting. Like Tesla is feeling it in a way that a lot of companies are feeling it. And that's, I think, unusual. like Tesla has virtually unlimited demand. They have never been like, we made too many cars. They're always like, we cannot make enough cars. Yeah at every yeah. point in history. And now I think Elon's predicting like they're going to make too many cars, which is surprising. Well, this is all happening at the same time that the Texas factory is coming online. The Berlin factory is coming online. Musk has described both of those factories as essentially just money furnaces at this mo at the moment <laughs> where he's just shoveling money into a furnace. Uh, the Shanghai factory continues to go through uh, a pretty like concerning cycle of opening and being forced to close because of COVID restrictions in China. I, I don't understand how that man gets a single uh, minute of sleep every night, considering just the, the numerous catastrophes and fires he's forced to put out on a, on a constant basis. And really, I think managing the lack of sleep explains a lot of the tweets. <laughs> he hasn't tweeted in nine days. It's good for everybody. Yeah. yeah. If you've noticed that the birds are singing a little bit more clearly outside your window <laughs> and people seem to be walking with a little bit more of an upright gait, it's because Elon Musk has not tweeted in eight days. Love this for all of us. The thing I'll say, though, I said basically, uh, you know, there's unlimited demand for these cars. But what is true right now is that they're being outsold by Hyundai and Kia, which have very hot EVs in the Kia EV6 and the Hyundai Ionic 5. I see Ionic 5s all over the place here. You know, I always look to see who's driving them and it's like... A wide selection of diverse people it's are just driving people. Yeah. Lives. It's just yeah. people. But with Teslas, like for a long time, I was like, oh, VC, VC, yeah. VC, startup guy, VC, VC. A lot um, of Patagonia vests. A lot of vests in Teslas. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't live in New York City anymore. And it's just, it's shocking to see how many EVs I see floating around. And then again, when I had the Lightning, I was like going to Chargers. And you just saw there, it was like mach Ionic 5s, and like the odd uh, Volvo XC40 recharge like populate all the chargers up here. And so I think about the fact that like Hyundai is actually taking share from Tesla has got to be weighing on Elon's mind as well. He's tweeted that they're doing a good job. Yeah. I mean, he, he was like, he's had the luxury of being kind of first mover in this space for a long time. And now he actually has to compete. 
and just the worst time to overextend yourself with a ton of new factories and a giant $48 billion Twitter purchase. Like, maybe not the best time to do all that. I think Hyundai and Kia made the, the right move, too, because they made enough cars for people to actually <laughs> buy, whereas a lot of the other automakers who are introducing these new EVs have limited supply. The, the F-150, they're only gonna be, there's only going to be like several thousand delivered probably this year. It's going to ramp up, obviously. But, you know, Hyundai actually, you know, Volkswagen, they sold out of the ID4. They there's not going to be any available until 2023. Like Hyundai and Kia, they actually made enough cars for people to buy. And demand is obviously very high right now because people are getting pinched real hard by the gas prices. So uh, I think that that was a smart move on Hyundai's part. They sort of came out at the right time, right place, right time, and they actually made enough. So now we got to talk about the Ionic 6, which, <laughs> boy, did, were they like, people will go with it. It's, yeah, I don't know how that, I don't, that thing looks strange. They're leaning into this like retro futurism thing, which like normally I think is like kind of a cool design choice and I'm with it. I, I'm here for it. But yeah, this one, I, 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 it seems like they're trying to do something like similar to like what Mercedes did with EQS. It's like extremely like bubble shaped and very like aerodynamic but yeah it's a sedan no one's gonna buy that in the u.s all i can think of is squishy minivan that's just what i look at when when i look at this is like somebody just took a minivan removed the bucket seats and was like here here it is you have a car now i've seen a number of people including marquez brownlee tweet that it looks like an apple magic mouse and then immediately <laughs> his replies yeah. had people photoshopping a charger into the bottom which is very good we'll see the notable thing i'll say about from this announcement you should go look at the picture it does look silly um, their head of design is like, we're sticking with buttons, like physical buttons. Touchscreens are dangerous when cars are moving. Yes. And I just want every car designer to like internalize this. Rivian's all touchscreens. The Lightning, regular F-150s have a lot of physical buttons, and the Lightning has that portrait touchscreen that takes the HVAC and puts it on the touchscreen. I and hate it's just it. like, what are, you, what are you doing to me, man? Like, I'm driving an eight-ton pickup truck. Like, I can't be messing with the seat heaters like this. Like, leave me alone. So I appreciate about it, Hyundai Kia. Can I just read this quote? Because I actually wrote this. I took this quote out of the story that we did and was like, this is the thing. This is the answer. And it's it's like you said, from, from Hyundai's design chief, whose name I should have written down and forgot. But it says, for us, anything that relates to the safety, we use hardware. Anything not related to safety, we'll use a touch interface. Like, that's it. Perfect. Crushed it. Love it. A plus. No notes. That is the answer. <laughs> Go look at that picture. I mean, tell me if you think it looks like a magic mask. I think it looks cool. It does look cool. It has like That's some a, like. It's got some PT Cruiser energy. Hmm. Wow. That's that's harsh. <laughs> Did you say cool yeah. and then PT Cruiser like right next <laughs> yeah. to each other? Did that happen? <laughs> I was going to say it has some old Porsche energy, but I would not have gone PT Cruiser. I want it to look like a car that Batman in the animated series would accidentally hit with his car while he's chasing the Joker. That's what I want from a car. And that's, this has got a little of that energy, that PT Cruiser energy. You want to be the NPC bystander car? <laughs> yeah. I want it to look like a weird 30s car as designed by an animator in 1992. Dream big, Alex. And that's very much where Hyundai is going. <laughs> that's, that's where they're going. They nailed it. That's true. Have you seen the new episode of Westworld season four? Or her job either. is writing backstories for NPCs, which is very funny because she was what? an NPC. Oh, my God. Oh, I love it. I don't know if it's any good, but I, I definitely laughed as I watched her try to explain. <laughs> and I was like, it's the Westworld thing, and she's on a date, and she's trying to explain what a video game is to, to her date. I'm like, have you been around? Like, Do people still not know what video games are in this future? It's very good. Last little Elon bit, uh, some Starlink news. First, Thomas Ricker, who lives in Europe, as you may know, uh, reviewed Starlink RV. That's a version of Starlink that you can just like take anywhere you want as long as there's service. You can uh, shut it off and not pay the monthly fee and then turn it on again when you're on the road. The trade-off is that you are lower in priority for bandwidth than anyone else. Thomas loved it. He was like mostly on beaches. He had a clear view of the sky, which is very important for Starlink. And he said it was faster than whatever cell internet options that he had wherever he was. And he did not notice the throttling. I will say two things. One, they've changed the design of the dish. And they've made it worse in some ways in the original dish than I reviewed and better in some ways. So better, it's smaller and it looks cooler. The worst part is very Vergecast. The my dish gets power over Ethernet. So yeah. you plug the dish into the power box and you plug the power box into the Wi-Fi router. And you just plug everything in and everything has power and you're off and go. One wire to each thing. This dish uh, attaches via micro USB. Oh, no. 
<laughs> That's just like a big, like falling on your face. It's a 70 foot micro USB cable <laughs> that attaches to the Wi-Fi router. You know, so, did I say 70? 75 foot micro USB connector. You can charge your old Kindle. And use <laughs> your Starlink dish. What are we doing? Like not like backwards, but also like backwards and sideways. Yeah. To go from <laughs> pure power over Ethernet to not even USB C, but like yeah, micro USB. Let's see what that is. He also said it rarely lines up properly, which is very good. So just like a confusing dish, but it's uses less power than my dish. Like there's all this there's benefits to the new dish and there's obviously trade-offs. So that's good. And like I said, he had he sent me the Slack. He's like, I had a very different Starlink experience than you. And I was like, did you have any obstructions? And he was like, no, we were like on beaches. Well but he also he framed it in a way I thought was really smart, which is basically like your experience was you were trying to replace your home internet, which is like a very high bar in terms of both reliability and speed. His, and he said this in the review, is his bar was basically awful cell service at the beach or at a music festival. And like beating that is really easy. And that's like, that's what Starlink is trying to do here basically. Right. So they're like, even if we throttle you, even if you have some obstructions, like you're going to get pretty good internet in places where pretty good internet is actually like a vast improvement over what you've had before. And I think Thomas might be being slightly generous in being happy with good enough internet, but like <laughs> good enough internet in a lot of places is, is a huge improvement. And I thought like, I just think that the, it's a clever way of thinking about it. What happens when you're like at Burning Man and everybody's got their internet? Cause that's totally a thing that happens at Burning Man, but everybody's got their little Starlink like system. Won't that actually make the internet worse if everybody adopts this? Well, so this is kind of what's happening with Starlink right now in general. Okay. So I'm a proud lurker of the Starlink subreddit. <laughs> and it's like one, to me, it's like one of the most chill places on the entire. It's just bros helping bros. Love it. Like everyone's just trying to solve the same problem, and they're like, Trees. "Should I climb this hundred foot pole with no safety <laughs> equipment to install Starlink?" And everyone's like, "You got it, bro!" Like it's great. Oh, Is the top <laughs> comment on every single one just like trees? Question mark. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion of trees and whether cutting them down or going over them is better. There's a lot of just like you know. I'll put this into like historical context, like. The big cable companies in the United States are now lumbering giants, but they were all started by effectively cowboys. Yes. Right. Who like wanted to help a community. And so they set up an antenna and like ran coax cable to their neighbors and they had like started a cable network. And I think that part of that story is so cool. And like, yes, now they're lumbering giants. Disclosure, Comcast, NBC, Universal, Sony Investor, and Fox Media. Um, and now we have to think about like Peacock and like whatever. You want. The minions exist, right? But they all, that, like even Comcast started as like this cowboy outfit. There's an element of the Starlink moment that has that cowboy energy that I think is great. And so it's just people like they can't get internet access where they are and they've got one tool to do it and they are overcoming whatever obstacles to figure it out. I think it's great. They don't like me very much because I said Starlink doesn't work with trees. <laughs> but I would just say, like, the revealed evidence is that trees are a problem for Starlink, <laughs> even in the subreddit. I ran into a woman this weekend and she uses Starlink. She does not read The Verge. It was very rude for her to say that, but it's fine. But she was like, yeah, I love Starlink, except for trees. Did you know that trees <laughs> are really bad for Starlink? And you said, oh. Uh, do I? <laughs> Anyhow, so like the subreddit's great. I uh, read it all the time. But the thing that is happening right now is the cells are getting overcrowded. So the Starlink divides up the map into these like honeycomb grids and that people are getting Starlinks and now you can get them. There's no wait list anymore in a lot of places. The RV has no wait list. You just get it in a week. And the speeds are dropping. They're dropping to about 40 to 50 down. And so like there's a, just a lot of, to David's point, there's a lot of justification now in that community over well, I was an early adopter. I was getting like 200 down and now I'm getting 40, but it's still better than my satellite <laughs> internet. And that's what you got to keep in mind. And I think that this trade off over, you know, Starlink is more or less cell towers in space. Like there's a physical limitation to what they can accomplish over time, even with more and more satellites and like whether they can pull off the whole business is like, it's running into its like first cap of limitations, which I think is fascinating. Is that why Starlink is fighting with Dish? Because it wants more spectrum to solve these problems? So deeply unclear okay. why they have chosen to fight with Dish. So no Verge story made less sense to me this week than Starlink and Dish fighting about spectrum. And we tried. We tried real hard with this. So Starlink <laughs> this week sent out an email to all of its customers saying, "End this. we ask for your support in ending a lobbying campaign that, makes, that threatens to make Starlink unusable for you and the vast majority of our American customers. So 
Dish wants to use 12 gigahertz spectrum for 5G. They have formed an alliance called the 5G for 12 gigahertz coalition. Woo. This is true. Uh, in the the trades and Fierce Wireless, which is a trade publication, there's a great line that's like, this is not to be confused with the 12G alliance. And it's like, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> like, what's happening with you people? Like, what's going on over there? So they form this thing where they want to p- use 12 gigahertz, which the FCC has provisionally said might be interesting. So DISH is doing studies about whether it can use 12 gigahertz for 5G. And they're pushing to a place where they can do it, it with this coalition. SpaceX is also using that spectrum. And so uh, they follow the FCC where it says they use 12 gigahertz spectrum as workhorse frequencies to provide critical downlink services across the U.S. If you open that spectrum up for 5G use, uh, customers will experience a total outage of service 74% of the time. So now Dish, which I would remind you, has no 5G network, Mm -hmm. (laughs) owns a ton of spectrum, has been required by the government to light up a network called Project Gen 5 Sys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that uh, we have two Project Gen 5 Sys phones. Mitchell has one, and Nathan Edwards, our new senior review editor, have one. We, we're going to have a piece coming out. But as of yet, those phones have mostly been on AT&T's network, <laughs> because that's what Dish is using as its backstop, which is very funny. So even the Dish network that is launched is still just AT&T. The world's first smart 5G network remains an illusion. <laughs> but Dish wants even more spectrum to take away from Starlink, and Starlink's in a fight with him. And it's like both of these things are like, what are we even fighting about? Like your network doesn't exist. Like you should just build the network you have. Are you going to convince Apple to put 12 gigahertz radios in the iPhone for 5G? No, I don't think you are. Like, I just doubt it. Especially when you have like four customers. This is how you end up with the Motorola Edge Plus is the only supported phone. (laughs) (laughs) And then obviously Starlink, you know, they're already using the spectrum, but it's amazing that they've built out a service that could be threatened by a competitor as ferocious as Dish Network. I thought it was wild that the FCC like started all this la- January of 2021, and it's only now in June of 2022 that SpaceX is like, oh wait, 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 we we need that. That's ours. We we need that really badly. Like, were you just not looking? Did you just not read the trades this for the last year and a half? Well, so I think one thing that's happening here is Dish already uses 12 gigahertz for its satellite TV service. They want to just like repopulate it and use it for 5G because yeah. they have some of the spectrum. I just like the phone networks are like the phones don't exist that like use this spectrum. So like where are they at? Anyway, Dish said a great line, which in the context of fighting over spectrum in space is great. We believe coexistence is possible. <laughs> Like, that's 100% what the president says after the aliens invade Earth. Like, <laughs> we believe coexistence is possible. Uh, uh, so we'll see. It's like one of the funniest broadband stories. in front Because, the, the, like, they have a network. They should just build that one. They have all of the spectrum. They can do it. I mean, they could. There will be more Genophysis coverage to come. I'm very insistent that we overcover Project Genophysis. So we're going to do it. All right, we got to take a break. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. It's good to see you, Squeege. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to do Truck Talk Round 2 in a couple of weeks, so you'll, you'll be back. Yeah, you'll be back. The Lightning Review is coming up, and we'll, we'll have you back for all that stuff. Okay. <clears throat> I've gone too far now, man. i got to do this one. I don't want to do this one. I kill my dog. My dog put a taco laco pool. I whoop, 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 whoop. Malakopatu, a la moya taya, a be se a brief. A pala poof, 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 my aya poof, aya poof, pakataka, kakataka, my a brief. And he said, Morris, no bit up, lad, well, see, not the palo pono, no taku la coto. No po beke no tale and no tale man. Why did you do that? Why do you do that, man? Why do you do that? Now you now you've got uh the briefing. Oh mira 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 Why doesn't this phone help me, you fucking idiot? Who fucking I bet you it's like this. <laughs> I bet you. I bet you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, daddy. Oh, yeah. 
Fucking asshole. Fucking asshole. What asshole? What the fuck? What are you doing, man? What you, did you do that? You, you know you did that on purpose. You're trying to say that I can't find the thing. You've done it a hundred times. It's just that the spelling Hector. It's it's the spelling, man. It's spelling Hector. I know, bro. I know, bro. <laughs> now it's worse now. Look, not even doing it now. Not even even looking for a <clears throat> Okay, I'm just going to tell you what I know. Imam. Listen to this shit, right? Listen to this shit. Listen to this shit. There's other people in different countries, right? And they are beautiful people. I know. Part of my relatives are beautiful people. Part of my people are beautiful people. They've traveled all around the world. They've done heaps of stuff, all right? This is coronavirus, all these things, the history. Uh, uh, to me, I have to Google. To me, I have to Google. To me, I have to Google. I can't do it. Let's try it one more time, one more time, one more time. I, I can't believe that this doesn't come up, Hector. That's silly. It's A, B, C. It's, it keeps saying, um, but uh, you know, look, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Hector, you, you, there's something wrong with you, man. You, you, you're sick or something. I'm not sick, man. You stupid. I had, I had this fucking years ago. Uh, it's not gonna come up, Hector. It's not gonna come up. It's not gonna come up, Hector. Not even you try, look, not even you try. See what I mean? See what I mean? Look, it, it, it daily, it's got the daily one, but it's not, man, it's not, you know. It's just done it, man. It's just done it for you, Hector. It's, 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 it's saying, you do not know how to spell the word Hector. You know why? Because y y you automatically think you know it all, right? You know it all. And when you cry... When you cry, you cry like a baby, Hector. You cry like a baby. You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. Don't worry, Hector. You cry like a baby. You cry like a baby anyway. But it doesn't matter. I'm not here to tell you different or anything. I'm talking shit. I don't care, man. I don't really care. I'm, I'm upset now. <laughs> this thing should be... Like, I should already be there. Right? I found it. Bet you this is it. Oh, yeah, I found it. I found it. After all this nonsense, me freaking out, it bloody found it. ABC News. Sonia Feng with the latest news headlines. French President Emmanuel Macron says he's ready to rebuild his country's relationship with Australia after meeting Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in Paris. The two leaders have held discussions to restore the relationship between their two countries, which deteriorated last year after former Prime Minister Scott Morrison cancelled a submarine contract with a French company. Mr Macron says the return of strong ties comes at a time of great uncertainty for the Indo-Pacific region. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has appealed against the British government's decision to extradite him to the United States. Mr Assange is facing 18 charges in America, including for spying over WikiLeaks' release of confidential US military records and cables. The High Court must now give approval for the appeal to be heard. And Ukraine's president has accused Russia of terrorism after a missile strike killed 21 people in a residential tower. The attack targeted the Black Sea port of Odessa one day after the retreat of Russian forces from Snake Island. President Volodymyr Zelensky says the strike was purposely aimed at civilians in retaliation for recent Russian defeats. ABC News. ABC News. Rima Chia with the news headlines. Flooding will continue across large parts of northwest and southwest Sydney today with more heavy rain expected. There are 97 evacuation orders and 60 warnings in place for Greater Sydney. OK, um, 11 towns are under, under floods. Um, electricity, there's something going on with electricity. It cuts out for a few hours. Um, there's still people looking for work. Um, they play a lot of sport, a, part, a lot of things to be um, fixed, mix, economics, uh, money. Uh, the politicians are having a hard time, but 
they they still good, still good, but uh, hard man, very hard. They they ask in England or, the, or whatever the uh, prime minister go to Ukraine because he's giving them million. I don't know why they want to arm up Ukraine. Anyway, anyway, uh, the, the life is beautiful. It's it's interesting and it's most um sporty, most family eating food, everybody having fun, enjoying life. <laughs> I don't know what you expect. You expect you are punching the head or something? Calm down. We are struggling and we are living it up, all right? We're doing both, struggling and living it up. We cry in between and we do what we can when we got to do, man. Adios la pico. Across large parts of northwest and southwest Sydney today with more heavy rain expected. There are 97 evacuation orders and 60 warnings in place for Greater Sydney, impacting around 45,000 people. There is major flooding in the Hawkesbury, Nepean, Georges and Warranora rivers with a severe weather warning for Sydney and the Hunter. If you're in an area affected by flooding, tune in to your local ABC radio station. On the radio or on the ABC Listen app for the latest updates, warnings and advice. The Prime Minister is expected to visit flooded parts of New South Wales in the next two days. Anthony Albanese is currently travelling back from Europe where he attended the NATO summit and visited Ukraine. It comes as more than 20 local government areas have been declared as disaster affected, activating federal funding support. Emergency Management Minister Murray Watts says Mr Albanese has been fully briefed on the situation. And data from Australia's largest health booking agency shows the average wait time to see a doctor has almost doubled in some states since 2019. Figures from online health booking agency Health Engine show some patients are waiting four days to see a GP. Dr Bruce Willett from the Royal Australian College of GPs says practices are struggling to cope with such a huge backlog. ABC News. ABC News. Steph Tiller with the latest news headlines. The New South Wales State Emergency Service says the state's flood crisis is far from over. More than 100 evacuation orders and over 50 warnings remain in place for residents in Sydney's northwest and southwest. The SES says more than 150 flood rescues have been carried out in the past couple of hours. Deputy State Duty Commander Ashley Sullivan says the heaviest rainfall is expected to be over the mid-north coast tomorrow. The Federal Treasurer is confident Australian households will be able to withstand the worsening cost of living pressures expected in the coming months. Jim Chalmers says the Reserve Bank's third rate rise in as many months will provide yet another challenge for households already dealing with the rising costs of groceries, fuel and power. But he says the economy can bounce back and a detailed plan to address the issue will be released over the coming weeks and months. And health experts believe a fourth COVID vaccine dose should be expanded to the general population as a new wave sweeps across the nation. A fourth dose is currently only available to people who are immunocompromised, those aged over 65 and Indigenous Australians. The Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation is meeting to discuss the merits of making a fourth shot more widely available. ABC News. OK, that was it. That was it. OK, it's over. Poor people that... Don't understand it. Why Australia like this? Why the world's like this? How are we doing? Where are we at, you rat bag? Look, mate. Um, I don't know. I go. I go out <laughs> and really have a good time, right? And come back um, all excited and everything. <laughs> with a hat on, right? Who knows? Who knows? You know, beautiful people will do beautiful things, mate. You know, interesting, interesting, whatever. You know, it's good. It's good. Whatever. Uh, I'm just saying that it's beautiful and interesting to have families, different families, people there, ladies, beautiful, nice, everything. Champions, sport, economics, but we're struggling. We're still 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 struggling. We are protesting and we are protesting. This, um, they just had the third shot, the fourth shot, the fifth shot. Anyway, yeah, they just... Don't kill the virus. I don't know why they don't kill the virus. They said they were going to do something that someone was going to kill the virus or 
arm up Ukraine, arm up Ukraine with different weapons, right? And then Russia will fight uh, Lithuania and all the countries around, all the border, Russia will attack them, okay? No worries. Go and read the Google, go do whatever you need to do. So, <coughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, a holiday to to Ukraine, I mean a holiday to Ecuador, a holiday to Wales, a holiday to Ireland, whatever. Um, today, I went out, I I good lunch, uh, I did everything with my ten dollars. Um, came back, I smoked chips of cigarettes. I didn't buy any alcohol because I got no money. I know I don't know. I just smoke cigarettes. That's all I do. And and I walk around and I try to do some exercise, gentle stretches, uh, meditating, mindfulness. Happy. My family is good. I love you. 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 Subscribe. Subscribe. And remember, this is not a joke. This is the real deal. All right. Subscribe. And anyway, any question, leave your question, amigo. Amigo. <clears throat> te amo. Te amo. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Please re reply. Please reply. YouTube. Please reply. YouTube. Please reply. Subscribe to Intermix Hector.